Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Now, I just want to trip to verse 16, please, Barry. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. So, well-known story, yes? Wise men, magi, no, not three kings. We really don't know how many there were. All we know is that we listed out three gifts. The great carol we're going to be singing this evening. We three kings of Orient are. Love it. It's a lovely tune, isn't it? But we don't know their names. There's their names listed. It, we don't know that. We don't know anything about them. This is it. This is the only report of these, these magi, these wise men. So before we get into this fully, there's some um, three comparisons that I want to show you that Matthew is trying to show here. Okay, so this is real quick. Um, the Gospel of Matthew is primarily recognized as being written for a Jewish set of audience. Okay, so this was, back then, these were people who had become Christ, well, we call them, we call it Christians now, that wasn't really, become followers of the Messiah, and they were Jewish. And uh, so this, therefore then, uh, Matthew is trying to show them and emphasize some parallels now with Jesus and characters in the Old Testament. So I want to quickly go through those parallels. Are you up for that? Are you with me this morning? Good, because I've had four hours sleep, so I need you to be with me this morning. And I'm discovering I've got older. I can't read properly anymore. I can't get my eyes to focus properly. I have to keep doing this. So you're going to see me doing this a lot this morning. So, number one, we saw in the story that the leading priests and the teachers of the law knew the prophecy that the Messiah was meant to be born in Bethlehem. Okay? And so they quoted to Herod, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 and 2 Samuel 5 verse 2 again. Okay? So they knew that this Messiah is meant to be born in Bethlehem. Now, isn't that interesting? You know, those prophesied to be born in Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is the town of King David. That's why, if you remember, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem to register for the census because he's a descendant of King David. So hold that thought. Right, number two. An Israelite would see this parallel. Visiting dignitaries from the east. These magi came from the east. Yes? 
So they would come, they're, they're sort of dignitaries. If they're wise men and major, if they got an audience with King Herod, they had to have been fairly dignified people, yes? So they come from the east. Now, in 1 Kings 10, 1 to 10, I'm going to read it, so bear with me a second. So 1 Kings 10. When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, which brought honour to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. So, I'm going to leave that at that for now. So, we've got the Queen of Sheba came from the east. So, the Queen of Sheba comes from the east to visit King Solomon, who is the son of King David, okay? So, you get this. And so, therefore then, and did you note the gifts that she brought? Gold and spices, Frankincense and myrrh are spices, and they brought gold. Do you, do you see the parallel that's going on? Okay? And bearing in mind, if also this is the other parallel, is that Jesus is known as a son of David. As, do, do you get the parallel that's going on? You with me? Okay. And then later on in Matthew, in chapter 12, verse 42, he eventually states about Jesus there is one greater here than Solomon. See, when we read our Gospels, they're not, the way they've been written is also in a, in a pattern that emphasizes a story as well. Okay. So that's the third parallel, that somebody who's seen it, going, ah, oh, people from the East, like Queen Sheba from the East, coming with gold and spices to visit the king of the Jews. Did, so, Yeah. So, all right, okay. I, I could do with some nodding if you are getting it. If you're not, I'm assuming you're not. So what I'm going to do is keep repeating it until eventually I get it. Can be one of those pastors who repeats the same sermon every Sunday until you start living it. Okay. Third parallel was on verse 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's appearance. Now, infant side, as they call it. I can't quite pronounce it properly. It's the typical thing. Um, Killing of all the under two-year-olds because the saviour stroke Messiah will take over the current ruler's power. Yes? Now, anybody want to know where there is another parallel story of infant side in the Bible, in the Old Testament? Where? Moses. Pharaoh wanted to wipe out all the children under a certain age to get rid of this saviour that was going to pull out the Israelites from slavery. So what we have here is two parallelisms. Herod is Pharaoh and Jesus is Moses. And that's how Matthew wrote it. So it's a true story, but it's actually trying to emphasize for you. If you take those parallels, if you was an, if you was an Israelite reading this right now and hearing it, you'll go, oh, that's like the Old Testament. That's like all these stories. This points to a Messiah. So what Matthew's trying to earlier on here show is that Jesus is both a Messiah, a king, and a saviour. And he relates to people from the Old Testament, from really from Jewish, from Jewish people's, it's their story. It's, it's Jewish people's story. This, the exodus, the, the pulling out of the slaves from, from Israel, etc., is part of their identity. Uh, Jewish people today repeat the story at Passover, how they got pulled out. And they were, so even people who are born now, who are, they connect back to their ancestors 7,000 years ago when they got pulled out. 
It's part of their rooted identity that they understand that they are free people under God's rule. That's how they understand it. And so therefore then, when you're reading that about the Messiah, you're seeing those parallels and it connects with your identity, or it should do. So those three parallels, I, I, I got excited. No? Okay. Did you want Joseph back? Okay. So that's what Matthew's meant to do. So let's actually look at our magi, shall we? Our stargazers, as they're also known as. Why would a bunch of non-Israelites, a bunch of Gentiles, want to make a journey for a baby? I hear you cry. Have you ever considered why they wanted to make the journey? They're, they're, not, they're not Jewish. So they're not connected with the people of Israel in, in being set free. And they're going all this way. And believe me, it took a months, nearly a few, nearly a, a year and a bit, at least coming up to two years. That's why all under two-year-olds had to be killed because of the timing that they saw the star to the time they finally arrived at Herod's palace. Would anybody want to make a two-year journey for a baby? No. I barely want to make a 20-minute journey for a baby, let's be honest. Wait till the baby grows up and they can actually acknowledge what I look like. Then they'll know. No, oh, okay. So, why did they do this? Well, we know that they were stargazers, sort of astrologers. We're not talking about modern-day horoscopes. Okay? I hate to tell you this, but horoscopes are not accurate, strangely enough. If you look at them, they're general enough that at some point that's going to happen to you that day. Horoscopes shouldn't be reading. Don't read modern day horoscopes. But they're not that. They're sort of astrologers who saw signs in nature. They recognized that actually in nature things might happen. It would point to something significant. And specifically for them, it was stars that they were looking at. Now, there is some great historical stuff here that we need to understand about what's going on for them. It's not like they just saw some star and went, ooh, baby born, let's follow star, find out where it goes. Okay, there was something behind their thinking. So the idea that a special star heralded the birth of a famous people or significant events were a widespread understanding in the ancient world. So if you saw a significant star, you would go, aha. Now, like some of us, sometimes we look up in the sky and go, wow, that's amazing. And then you realize it's an airplane. Ever done that? I've seen a star moving. I've gone, oh, wow, that's Brit Oh, it's an airplane. Right. So in the ancient world, they had this thing, they had this sort of connection that they understood stars. Now, it's been going on for ages, but it distinctly made a, a real big deal in 44 BC. Julius Caesar, ever heard of him? He died. And at his funeral, and it was a funeral with the funeral prior where they, they um, cremated him, set light to him. And at his funeral pyre, what happened was that a supernova happened at exactly the same time. A star went supernova. So they gave rise to the belief that Julius Caesar had joined the pantheon of gods in the heavens and was truly divine. Don't forget, in Roman understanding, a Caesar suddenly became a god, suddenly became divine. And so that really helped. Just, just as the smoke's rising, supernova happens, Julius Caesar has gone to join. A king has gone up there. So therefore then, by this point now, stars signified great men. Sorry, ladies. Signified great men. And also, by the first century, so by the time that Jesus is being born, a rumor was already doing the rounds at the ancient world that, that, that there was a belief that world domination would come out of Judea. So you want to take, sort of, add those things together. Does that make sense? 
So you can imagine. So I don't know about you, but in, in our culture, there's this, you hear rumors of rumors and you pick up what they call fake news these days and, and whatever else. And it suddenly becomes the truth and belief until somebody eventually debunks it and say, no, that's not true. This is where this story's come from. So could you imagine this rumor is doing the rounds that actually at some point world domination is going to come out of Judea. So you can imagine these stargazers are looking for stars to see a significant birth or significant ruler. And then when it's out coming out and it's pointing them towards Judea, they're thinking, aha, this is worth a journey. So you can understand. And then we also want to go to Jewish understanding that a star formed part of an expectation of the Messiah. They're expecting a significant star to happen, to form, to tell them that the Messiah has been born. This is all adding up. Do you notice how I love it? I love the fact that nothing's clean. It's, it's little bits that add up that make people want to do something. Where does this thing come from? Well, Balaam. Balaam, famous for the talking donkey. Way prior to Shrek. Okay, so uh, it's in numbers. I knew I'll have to throw in a Shrek comment or else. And I'm sure he's going to be one of the Christmas movies this, this, this Christmas. Numbers uh, uh, 25, verse 15 to 19. So Balaam, as we know, got hired to go and um, uh, curse the people of Israel, to curse the Jewish people. He got hired to do it. But the, the whole point of the talking donkey was God heading him off at the pass and saying, uh, excuse me? Uh, no, you're not going to do that. And he was beating the donkey, if you remember, because the donkey wouldn't move, and it was because there was an angel standing there with a sword, and, and, it, and the yeah, donkey is actually saving his life, ultimately. And that's why the donkey started talking to him. Why are you beating me? If I could do a sort of a... Um, no, I can't. I can't do an impression of... Um, no, I can't. I can't even know. No. no, did my acting last week. We're all right. Donkey. So anyway, um, <laughs> oh gosh, Lord, forgive me, please. Uh, so uh, numbers, numbers. Oh, sorry, it's numbers twenty-four. I don't know why I said twenty-five. It's numbers twenty-four. So this is the final message of Balaam. When he realised afterwards, he couldn't curse. He had to bless the people of Israel. Okay, so he had to bless them. So this is the last message that he delivered. This is the message of Balaam, son of Boa. The message of the man whose eyes see clearly. The message of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes open wide. I see him, but not here and now. Do you want me to repeat that again? You think he's talking about, I see God clearly, I see a vision. And I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the foreheads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Steth. Edom will be taken over, and Seir, its enemy, will be conquered, while Israel marches on in triumph. A ruler will rise in Jacob, who will destroy the survivors of Ai. Amazing, okay? So, so you take that moment, so a star will rise in Jacob. So by this point, by the time you got to the first century, they're thinking we we're looking for a significant star to occur. And the scepter, as we know, a scepter is a symbol of power, authority. So they're looking for this ruler to come out of Israel. So they're looking, so the Jewish people are also looking for a concept of a star. So you can imagine why Matthew sticks the story of the Magi in the gospel, because it involves a star. I'm quite excited, no? Okay. I love this. 
So you can understand why you add that all up, the rumor in the first century, Jewish people, and what got me was the major, I clearly knew the scriptures as well. Because they knew that it had to be a new king of the Jews. They didn't understand beyond that. So you can understand why they took that entire journey to go and see a baby. Because it wasn't just in the Jewish scriptures, the understanding, but also within the wider society, they were looking for a significant king, a significant person to appear. And for me, it means God does communicate through other stories. Okay. Now, let's very quickly. So I've always been rather disparaging of the Magi because they're known as the wise men. And the in-joke has always been, if they were so wise, why would you go to the current king and go, we're looking for the new king? Especially when Herod was known as being a bit of a despot and a bit of a nutter. So I've been rather disparaging. But when you break this all down, you get the logic. They're expecting to see a new king. So the logic is, a new baby's been born, you're going to expect that baby to be born into the current king dynasty, aren't you? King, not Ming. Let's not get mixed up with the current king dynasty. So you're going to expect the new king to be born to the current king. So you can understand why they went to Herod. That makes logical sense. I, I, I feel a little bit more, um, for, I, I need to sort of ask apologies from them when I meet them. I'm saying, sorry, Major, I really got that wrong. I do apologize. So you can understand that logic. And I suppose that logic is because even though they were looking for something fantastic in the stars, they understood rumors. They understood probably the Jewish scriptures that this was also significant. What's interesting, they were still looking for God through human viewpoint and understanding. Because if they knew the whole of the Jewish scriptures, that made it all add up, you'd see clearly in Isaiah 53, etc., that, well, they, weren't, they would have understood that, that actually this new king is not going to be born in a palace. It's not going to be somebody significantly easily known. So I, for me, I looked at that and I thought, yes, they went. They, they wanted to go and pray homage to this new baby. They, they saw clearly this new baby is going to be bringing um, a, a world of domination. This, this baby was, this new king was going to rule the entire world and dominate the world. And don't forget, that's what was going on, wasn't it? It's been the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans. They, they, they almost had world domination over the centuries. So you can imagine why they want to go and do this. They want to go and make sure, A, they're all right. Here's the gold. Here's the frankincense. Here's the myrrh. Not cheap spices. And, and, and so they probably wanted to make sure that they also got sorted out and settled. But they were seeing everything from a human viewpoint. So while they were reading the scriptures, they weren't understanding the full significant spiritual understanding. Because it is world domination, but not in the way that they understood it. And I can imagine you're, you're reading that prophecy. They're going to crush the heads of the serpents and do all this sort of stuff. You can imagine that's how the Jewish people thought that Jesus, especially the apostles, they thought that Jesus was going to kick the Romans out in some big bloody war. Did you get the completely misunderstood, the fact it was crushing death? So I love this with the Magi. So, so they follow this star, and I, I don't want to get into the whole which star and was it three different stars and all of that. You know, there's, there's lots of speculation about how it could have happened and there's, um, they've gone back in history. They know about the time when Herod uh, had died, so we know roughly when these Magi must have met him. We know that the infant side, the death of the under twos, when that's recorded. So then they can look back at the stars and they can see roughly about three stars and when they appeared, and even not actually what date specifically they appeared. It's all lovely, but I also like the logic that maybe God just made a star move. Why not? If he can make a, a, a pillar of cloud move and a fiery pillar move, why not a star? Just so he's in the mood. 
Anyway. I just look at the major and I just get the importance. Now, this is the next thing. Is that God, for me, was looking and talking through his creation. These magi weren't specifically seeking out the Messiah, Messiah. And they probably didn't overly know. They knew some of the scriptures. They must have understood for a significance. But they would have been basing everything they understood from their understanding of rumors and creation. So it's through God's own creation that he was still talking to people. Now, it's absolutely right that we say that God primarily talks through the his word but he also talks through his creation has anybody ever had god talk to them through his creation and i'm not talking about us humans i'm talking about the rest of creation you know you've ever stared at something long enough and and god starts talking to you through it pointing out something to you I've only gone on for 25 minutes. Seriously, I'm finishing soon. Is anybody? <laughs> is anybody? Yeah? Anybody want to talk about it? All right, Martin, coming over. I was asleep one night in bed, and I'd had this dream. I don't know what it was about. All of a sudden, I felt as if someone was saying to me, don't worry, I'm with you. Don't worry, my my son, I'm with you. I woke up and I was sweating, I was frightened. I could still hear this voice saying, don't be frightened, my son. It's I, God. I've never been so so frightened. And he just said to me, don't worry, I'm with you. Don't worry. Sleep in, in peace, my son. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, I could imagine one level it is. Anybody else? Yeah, Jenny, good. Yeah, come on, people. Stop thinking about your Christmas shopping. So when my husband left, um, the children asked for God to give them a sign that everything would be okay. And we saw really unusual animals. So um, there was a time we were traveling home from my parents and they were all upset because they were leaving, granny and granddads. And a deer came out in front of the car. I was absolutely sure I was gonna hit it. I closed my eyes. And it just went away. And the three of them said, you know, that's God. He's looking after us. He showed us a deer. How exciting is that? Cool. There you go. Next. Seriously. Yeah, um, I think there was a day I was, I used to be at Ealing. I was walking up to where my car was parked about a mile from where I work. And I was, I was walking past the green. I saw um, loads of, it was an autumn time, there was loads of um, yellow leaves. And I could hear God saying, that's just, you know, this is, this is me, this is, this is my street painted with gold. And I thought, yeah, I, I can see. I just thought, like, the, the leaves were just like, like a gold dust on the, on, the, on, the, on the tree. So I took the picture. And that Sunday I came to uh, church and we had lunch or so. And I happened to be sitting next to um, Andy Wilson, and he was saying to me about where he walked, and there was a, you know, uh, there was a, like loads of green, uh, yellow leaves all painted. I said, "Oh snap!" And I thought I quickly brought my phone out and I showed him. I said, "He said I could just hear God telling me this is my street painted with gold," and that was like. It's sort of, I thought, God, yeah, I hear you clearly. It was just amazing. And I kept the picture for a long time. Thank you. Anybody else? Is that you, Joe? Cool. And so I'll be there, right? What happened was one Sunday when I came here, like I do now, I dreamt afterwards that, uh, oh, I fell asleep in the church, actually. I, I was preaching, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the other guy, Mr. <laughs> Wise. Um, and uh, I dreamt about the drains, something, was it mist or fog coming out of it? Next week I know the floor was in trouble. There you go. So you could have given us a warning, yeah? 
No, it's fine. Bless you, Joe. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Joe. So I, I've known Joe for ages. He only lives down the road. It's fine. Um, about two or three days after my granddad died, um, last two months ago, um, I was out in Norwich with some friends, and my granddad's name is Emrys, and so that's not the most common name ever. And so we were out in Norwich, and I just happened to look to my right, and in one of the shop windows, I'd never been to this part of Norwich before, in one of the shop windows, it was painted on the window, Emrys. Oh, wow. And yeah, I just I couldn't really get my head around that. Oh. So yeah. Cool, brilliant. You see, God does communicate with us. Anybody else? I've had, I, I'm not going to go too depth because I'll be here for hours and, and you don't want that because you've all got your Christmas shopping to do. So anyway, the, um, one of them was I was sitting out in our garden and I was praying and, and, and uh, so I was praying and I was talking to God and I wanted to talk about something significant and I've been watching uh, prior to that a movie and it was all sort of big and up in space and and all of that do you know what i mean it was one of these big epic moves i love all those sort of things as we all know and so um actually it wasn't star wars no i think it was superman anyway it's irrelevant what it was it was it was all based in space and stuff so then i decided to go outside inside into the garden and start praying and talking to the lord and while i was talking to him sorry the reason i'm looking down is because i'm trying to visualize this in my head and remember how it went i started looking at the ground and i saw this literally uh, minute couple of minute uh, bugs and creatures moving and it was one of these moments where it almost felt like the world had slowed down do, 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 I don't know if you ever have that where literally the world literally just started slowing right down and I could literally I, it was that like everything was almost stopping and just we was in this moment and I was looking at these creatures and just looking at the intricacy of them and looking at their patterns on the body and how they're moving. And then I saw the bark that they were sort of on. And, and it was just amazing. So I haven't got this amazing garden. But it was just, I was just there for ages. And God just said to me, he said, yeah, I'm in the big and I'm in the little detail. I worry about both. So you don't. And that was just while I was staring at it. And it was amazing. And then my my my... My other biggest stuff is, is, is um, you know, I love going near the sea. Who doesn't like the sea? Maybe some people don't, but, you know, I love the sea. I love it most when it's absolutely going to town and the waves are spilling up and over. Don't be too near to them. Be safe. And they're spilling and it's rolling. And I just love that moment because it just tells me that God is just so much amazing. And the power of God is more significant than those waves will ever be. And just the way it rolls in and out is just like God's season. His, his, oh, anyway, I could go on forever. But it, it just gets me that God talks through everything. Now, it all has to be tested by scripture, let's make that very clear, that's why. Notice they were looking for a star, but it was based in scripture. Okay, so, so there is this, this basis, and you look at the whole of scripture, there were other significant things that point to that Jesus is the Messiah. So for today, I want us to walk away with the fact that we were talking, we've been talking right from the beginning, that there is no such thing as the perfect Christmas. There is no such thing. I can guarantee most of us at the end of the Christmas dinner, about four o'clock in the afternoon, will be a bit tired and a bit tetchy. Yes, it won't be. This is just a prophetic statement to my, my mum already, that your, your son might be a bit tetchy by four. No. <laughs> so my mum's just looked at me going, you think you're going to be tetchy at our house, yeah? Um, no, mum, of course I'm not. Um, so, um, because we are, bad at the time, we get tired, but that's no excuse, by the way. If you know you're getting tetchy, pray about it. So, um, but, but there's no such thing as the perfect Christmas. It doesn't exist. Okay? That's the starter. The second thing is, is that, that we also said this year that, 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 that part of this year is expectant. Expectant God to do the unexpected. So, we didn't expect God to not allow us to have, to have any musicians at all this morning. But I enjoyed the worship because it is stripped back. I've not relied upon suddenly Andy drumming just at the right moment that makes me feel, oh, yes, I want to worship God.
so let's look at the way that these magi, they really didn't know what they were heading out to look at. They had one expectation. God had something completely different. So today, for this week, don't forget, theirs wasn't perfect. They arrived at the wrong place. And so they had to go another seven miles when they realized they had to go to Bethlehem. And they didn't find a baby, they found a child, by the way. Thought I mentioned that, just in case you didn't know. God bless the nativity plays. Uh, they're wonderful, but the Magi did not turn up at the same time as the shepherds. That's why Herod called for under two-year-olds, because he was expecting this baby by now to be about 18 months old, given the timing that they saw the star and how long it took them to get there. So what we should really do is do a nativity play, get the shepherds to turn up, and then wait 18 months and do it again for the Magi to turn up. Now, that would be fun, wouldn't it? In the middle of summer, Merry Christmas! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just thought of that. Um, so, just, so these major, I didn't know what to expect, and we don't. But I want us to get the fact that actually when we walk out there, God talks through creation. Be expectant of God to talk to you through creation. Even through the wind that you might cop this afternoon at five o'clock. If it's raining on you, go, that's a blessing from God, not, oh, I'm wet. And sometimes with the Magi, it was an arduous journey. It was a long route to go and worship Jesus. Sometimes our lives are an arduous, long journey with God. It's not all Christmas. Still the same God. So expect God to talk to you through creation. Expect God to be God. And bring your all to him, as the Magi did. Let's bow our heads. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you do speak to us uh, through not just your word, but through your creation. Um, actually, it was by your word that everything came into creation and being. So, Father, I just thank you for that. I want to ask, Lord, for each and every one of us. Some of us got cold. Some of us are just not well. Some of us are stressed out. We haven't got our Christmas shopping. Lord, help us to be open to hearing you this Christmas. Help us to be able to be listening to you, speaking to us help us Lord to see parallels in stuff that you've done in the past that you're now doing with us here in the present help us to love you more this Christmas in the name of Jesus Amen We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.